So I'm Rich Lucas, as I said, from the Department of Psychology, and now I'll be able to explain what I mean by subjective well-being. Uh, so when I talk about subjective well-being, usually what I mean is in this overarching evaluation of the quality of a person's life from his or her own perspective. And the reason we are interested in subjective well-being are a couple of different reasons. One is that people want to know what are the things that they can do in their lives to make them happy. And actually, the number of people's three words, something related to happiness was mentioned. So we want to look at the characteristics that are associated with this and try to figure out how people can get to that point. But in addition to that, both in applied and theoretical research, we can use well-being measures as a way to actually evaluate other things that are going on. So for instance, when we look at theories about how the mind works and what basic needs people are approaching, we can see, we can measure their well-being to see whether or not they're accomplishing these things. In applied research, we can we know that an intervention may affect these different aspects of our lives in different ways. And, uh, one intervention may affect, positively affect our health, but it might negatively affect our social relationships. We want to know whether there is an overall benefit. We can often use measures of subjective well-being as an over, overall global evaluation to see whether there's a net positive for people. So in our research, what we try to do is to take this approach and use it as this overall evaluation. We've done this in our individual level research. People are increasingly applying this to look at the well-being of broader populations. So what you have up here is a map of the life satisfaction of different counties throughout the United States. The white is where we don't have enough data. Uh, but from the dark, lighter green to the darker green, that's where the happier counties are in the United States. Presumably, we can use this information to get some sense about what sorts of policies are actually leading to happier places. We can use this information to figure out what we can do to make uh, our, our cities and counties better. Now, I got into this uh, uh, looking at subjective well-being research in the context of aging for a number of re reasons. One is just that a lot of the things that we are interested in think that might matter for subjective well-being are things that actually change uh, as people go through their lives. So we've already heard about things in terms of changes in health status, changes in resources that people have, changes in social relationships that, that, that people have. And so this leads to really important questions about what that means for this overall evaluation over time. So we can simply look uh, at what happens to things like life satisfaction over time. And this is, these are the results from one study we did with a very large nationally representative sample of people in the United Kingdom. You don't have to pay attention to the different lines. Basically what we have here is along the x-axis we have age, and on the y-axis we have ratings of life satisfaction. What we see there is that people's life satisfaction actually declines through the early part of adulthood. So the, the relatively happy when you're 16, 17, and you kind of decline. Uh, this is a relatively common finding. Uh, it gets down to the lowest point around 45 or 46. But then we have this nice optimistic picture from that point forward where we can start to climb back up. And the highest points that we typically find are around age 70 or 75. Uh, and this, again, finding is not always there in all the data, but it's a relatively consistent finding. So this tells us something about what's happening during the lifespan, and that gives us some insight into the processes that are going on that are leading to well-being. So as health uh, changes, as relationships change, as people's perspective on what their life changes, what role does that then play in this overall evaluation that people have? And we can do studies like this to see what is going on. In addition, what we can do is actually in some studies, we have data from people over time where we can actually see them as they experience major life changes that are associated with aging. So one of the big questions we faced when we studied well-being is whether or not the things that happen to us really matter. There's this idea that some people are born happy and there's nothing that they can do to change the level of happiness over time. And in fact, within the psychological literature on subjective well-being, this idea has actually gained a lot of, uh, has been very appealing and has received some support. Uh, unfortunately, for a long period of time, we really didn't have the research to tell us whether or not well-being changed over time and whether it was influenced by life events. But more recently, there have been these massive studies that have followed tens of thousands of people for up to 30 or 35 years, these large panel studies, um, where we can actually follow them to see what's going on in our lives. And so what we've tried to do is take advantage of those studies to look at major life events like marriage and widowhood and divorce and unemployment to see whether people are affected by those life events, where they then start to bounce back and whether they can ever get back to where they were. And these are the results of just a couple of the events we've studied. Unfortunately, when we look at things like marriage, what we find is people do increase a little bit as they come close to this marriage. They get a nice boost around the time, but then they pretty quickly come back to where they were. So no benefits or long-lasting benefits for marriage. But when we look at some negative life events, what we find is that life satisfaction does change. And sometimes that change is permanent. So it's worth looking at the factors that actually do lead to changes in life satisfaction and well-being over time 
um, because these things can add up and have a big impact on the overall evaluation that people experience. So I'll stop there. Um, uh, these are the types of things we're looking at. I'm looking at well-being over the life course. Thank you, Rich.